my part of the re report on the conference um, starts, first of all, <clears throat> it's the International Conference on the Bible and Science Affirming Creation. And uh, there are about 450 people there. Um, a significant majority of them were from outside of the United States and Canada and people from Europe. We had people from uh, South America, Central America, Africa, Asia, the um, Far East, uh, various islands. Um, <clears throat> um, the conference lasted for about 10 days plus travel. And uh, just to give you an idea, um, it was the 15th through the 24th of August for those of you don't know. This is a shot on Sabbath across the conference center and you can see I haven't included everybody. If we swing the camera around, we get a few more people, including you may recognize this young lady right here. And uh, you may recognize the gentleman sitting next to her. Um, but uh, as you can see, there's a, quite, a, quite a few people in the, uh, in the audience. Um, we did a couple of field trips, um, <clears throat> one of them to the Grand Canyon, the North Rim, and you can, that gives you an idea of the beauty of the place, for those of you who have not been there. Um, I'm going to give you the quick summary in just a minute, but before I do that, I'm going to um, um, just run you past the schedule really quick. <clears throat> and I'm going to come back to my voice in a minute. <clears throat> um, Thursday we had uh, several presentations and um, they went uh, devotional and then a welcome and then a purpose and then after they got done we had an introduction to geology and then went to the uh, um, um, Virgin River Gorge. Beautiful place. Lots of nice geology. And then we went to um, check into St. George, which is where most of our stuff was held. That's where all those photos were from. <clears throat> and uh, had a couple more. Um, biblical talks at the, at the end. So the, the first whole day uh, was devoted to either field trips or, or uh, the Bible. The next day was also devoted to field trip to uh, Zion National Park, which is beautiful. And uh, I wound up uh, giving one of the devotions on the bus. As it turned out, mine was bus number four, which happened to have, among other people, um, Ted Wilson. So <clears throat> it's kind of interesting to uh, be giving a devotional to, uh, among others, the president of the General Conference. Um, then we went to, to dinner. We had a little panel at the end, which was not very much. So Sabbath, uh, there wasn't a lot really specifically scheduled. Um, Sunday, we started talking about um, biblical principles, but then quickly switched to the Yellowstone Fossil Forest, and Art Chadwick gave it an excellent review on that. Um, then we went back to religion, and then um, looking at pseudogenes, as well as the Yellowstone, and um, talked about the relationship between science and religion. Leonard Brand gave that talk, an excellent talk. Then he talked to, about naturalism. And um, then we went back to religious concepts and uh, biblical archaeology. And then we had something that was fairly common afterwards, which was we had a panel at the end. Uh, where the people who had given the talks during the day 
were basically kind of put on the hot seat, although the, the questions that were asked were written, um, uh, and they never were able to get to all of them because there are always more questions. And if I were doing it, I think I would have had more of a panel after maybe each presentation because I think that the give and take was, was extremely healthy. But this is their first time doing this, so it's not terribly surprising. Um, <clears throat> then Sunday and Monday, we again had a devotional and then intelligent design and the thinking Christian design of uh, evolution of protein functions. Again, back to the Bible uh, and to the Bible and then uh, archaeology and biological sciences and biological sciences and all of the very good talks, all of them. And then um, in the afternoon we had biology again and then we had something interesting which is uh, academic freedom, faculty selection and development. Unfortunately, that's one talk I missed so I'm going to have to let somebody else comment on it because uh, just before this talk began, uh, somebody uh, uh, fainted. And so as the camp physician, I had to go over there and attend that person until he went to the hospital, which he finally did. Uh, he recovered nicely, but his sodium was around 120, so. Um, and um, <clears throat> so I missed that whole talk. So that's, that's one hole in my knowledge. Um, and then, again, we went back to uh, science. And then uh, at 7 o'clock, Kurt Wise, who's not an Adventist, but who studied under, uh, he's a creationist, short-age creationist, and he studied under Stephen Jay Gould, gave a talk which was absolutely fascinating. And um, one of the things he touched on was we need to be really careful. Apparently somebody wrote to Stephen Jay Gould that he was praying that he would get cancer. And he got it. And as you can imagine, that was not a good influence on Stephen Jay Gould. <coughs> um, then Tuesday, uh, we have the, the Genesis Flood, John Baumgartner, they, who again is not an Adventist, but some of you have been here when he's, been, he's talked here. He's a short age creationist. And um, then Paul Buchanan talked about the Green River. Art Chadwick talked about paleo currents, which is a very good talk, and I'm hoping that that eventually makes it into some kind of literature so that people can see it. Ronnie Nealon talked about uh, the geologic record. Uh, Art Chadwick talked about bioturbation, which is fascinating as well. There isn't as much as you'd expect if the geologic column was deposited as slowly as is claimed. Then uh, we went back to religion. And then after lunch, Kurt Wise talked about radiometric dating in general. I missed the very first part of that because I was trying to get my paper printed out desperately because I didn't have a printer up there. I should have brought my own. It would have been simpler. Um, but we finally got it done, and I got to hear the last part of it, and, and I thought it was very good, uh, the part I heard. Then uh, I presented, and... Uh, yeah, kind of an interesting sidelight. <clears throat> I went there with a very good voice. As uh, time went on, I started get d developing laryngitis. And as I usually do when that happens, I l let my voice go down, lower. And it hit Tuesday, it hit the very lowest peak, just at the time I was talking but it hadn't yet broken up. It doesn't have this kind of hoarse sound that I've got now. 
So <clears throat> I presented my paper in my very best uh, James Earl Jones voice. <laughs> and uh, it was kind of, kind of interesting. Um, I was thankful that I hadn't gotten laryngitis. Two days earlier, I had been hung. But uh, <clears throat> as time went on, I was able to talk less and less. Um, Art Chadwick then presented on the Moen Kopi. Um, Leonard Brand from Lessons in the Coconino Sandstone, which is very interesting. And then John Whitmore, who is at Cedarville University Baptist, presented on the Coconino Sandstone injectites. Coconino Sandstone goes down into cracks in the hermit shale. And it looks like they were injected into it under pressure. Um, it, and the interesting thing is there's a significant gap. What is it about? It's supposed to be 10 million years or something like that? Um, that, that, that the hermit shale just sat there on the surface without eroding, leaving this nice flat thing. And then the coconut sandstone comes over it. And the hermit shale starts to separate in places in the coconut sandstone goes down inside. In the meantime, during those 10 million years when it's sitting there, either the cracks didn't form, or if they did form, they didn't collect dust, which is a little bit on the weird side. Um, anyway, uh, John Whitmore talked about geology at Cedarville University, and then R. Chadwick and introduced us to the Grand Canyon field trip, which was the next day. <coughs> and we went to the Grand Canyon. And uh, came back. Basically, there was no meetings uh, that day. It was all taken up with the field trip. Um, again, I wound up uh, giving the devotional for bus four as we were leaving. Uh, Thursday, um, we came back to uh, the devotional principles of biblical thought. Um, Leonard Brand, Keith Snyder, I talked about dinosaurs. Lee Spencer uh, actually didn't talk. Uh, Lucinda Hill Spencer, uh, his wife, was there. Uh, she's a, an emergency physician also. And uh, she gave a very good presentation of the material that he'd collected. I, I'm sure with her help too. And then Richard Davison talked about non-biblical hermeneutics. Um, we then worked on a statement that uh, came out, and uh, I'll let uh, Dr. Br uh, Dr. Roth say more about that. Um, then uh, Leonard Brand talked about fossil turtles. Uh, again, Lucy uh, Hill Spencer talked about uh, Fossil eight men, kind of proposing that there may have been some um, interbreeding. Um, Rella Speranti actually didn't talk about faith time in the fossil whales here. He talked about that the next day. He switched talks. Apparently, his computer ate it just before he was ready to give it. So. He took his presentation, Arguments Creationists Should Not Use, and moved it up. And then the faith and the time in fossil whales went down below. Susan Phillips and, and a panel talked about how science teachers can nurture faith. And we had dinner and free evening, which was <coughs> welcome to some of us. Um, this is a day is uh, it's a pretty big day, and you actually have to start, if you're going to get there on time, you have to start well below, before 6.30. Um, and I wound up having to help out with the music more than I was uh, expecting when I went there. Um, and Friday, we again talked about biblical, non-biblical hermeneutics. And... Um, then Darwinism's Influence on Morality, which is done by Tim Standish, which is good. And then Jim Gibson talked about that evolution is not 
that there are some parts of evolution that are actually true, and we need to be careful about not throwing everything out when we throw out um, the complete story of long ages. Um, our Chadwick pointed out that evolution couldn't meet the challenge of the fossils. And Leonard Brand talked about the new biological insights that evolution really doesn't answer. And then, um, then we came back to, as I said, the, uh, uh, the fossil whales. <laughs> Leonard Brand then uh, talked about why we behave as we do, and as a sociobiology. Um, and actually, that sociobiology does not account for everything. Um, and then Marcus Ross talked about paleontology. Marcus Ross is uh, from Liberty University and is again Baptist. Um, Andrea Luxon talked about crea uh, creation literature and the arts. And then a student panel talked about what creation means to me. Um, <clears throat> Richard Davidson and Leonard Brand have written a little book called Choose You This Day. Some of you may remember we actually had it presented here once, um, and they presented it there. And then uh, uh, Lisa Beardsley Hardy talked about the purpose of Adventist education. And Mike Ryan talked about the role of creation in the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And then Jim Gibson talked about the creator of nature and the nature of the creator. Basically, it's theological reflections upon what evolution actually means and, and uh, and how nature looks. It was a very insightful talk. And then uh, Doug Zinke, who's Ed's son, talked about what creation means to me, and Ed Zinke talked about the doctrine of creation and personal relationship with God. <coughs> and finally, Sunday, we kind of wrapped everything up. Um, a devotional, uh, and then a couple of talks, three talks, in fact, on environment. And then they talked about the role of the Geoscience Research Institute, the nature of truth, and what to do with uncertainty, and why I believe in creation. Uh, and then uh, Suzanne Phillips made her summary. They actually skipped a panel, and Ted Wilson gave his summary, and then we all packed up and headed. Uh, <clears throat> I headed to work, although I stopped by Las Vegas to grab a meal since they were offering a free one there. And uh, then everybody else headed out on planes, most of them on, mon um, on Monday morning. So that was what the conference was about. I'm sorry? Was this invitation only or anybody was able to go? Um, it was, I think, pretty much invitation only. Are they going to, was this an unusual get together? It took several years or to plan or are they going to have I don't know. After having done it once, I think they will do it again. I'm not, I, I'm, I'm sure that some of the format will change. Uh, I don't know in what ways. Um, I'd like to see it uh, change. I will, um, I will say this. Let's see if I've got it right here. there. Um, the conference itself was solidly behind the Bible. It was also, of course, solidly short age, which comes with the territory if you're solidly behind the Bible. And uh, it dealt less with the integration of the Bible and science, although there were some science talks. But one of the, one of the things that was emphasized, especially by Ed Zinke, was that the Bible is our foundation, period. It's not the Bible and something else, and of course, that means it's not the Bible and science, and it raises the question of what, how we integrate, why, why should we do uh, work on carbon-14 dating, or work on paleocurrents, or work on uh, paraconformities, if, w if the Bible's enough anyway? Why bother? And I'm, I don't think we've satisfactorily solved that uh, problem yet. Um, but that's the end of my uh, part of the presentation. I'm going to turn the time over to Ario Roth now. And I see that we do have 
uh, another participant in the meetings, uh, Bernard Brandstater here. So we, we will at least give you the chance to make a comment or two while Ariel Roth is setting up, maybe. Microphone is yours. Thank you for the warning, that 10 second warning, Paul. <laughs> Well, I didn't know you'd be here, so. Uh, <coughs> here's a comment or two. Uh, this was indeed a, an invitation mm -hmm. conference which brought 450 people together from all over the world, actually. Over several years, it's become very clear uh, to the, the Bible and Science Council in Silver Spring that uh, there have been many cross-currents of opinion circulating within the church. And uh, it has been felt <coughs> necessary to try and achieve at least something approaching a consensus there had been a previous world conference, some of you may recall, in 2003, at least here view, which was wide open to anybody who, who was interested enough to register and pay his own way to be there and, and to give a paper, perhaps. The trouble was, in 2003, there was so much uh, action, counteraction, and... Uh, disagreement, disagreement, and confusion that uh, although it was a useful airing of opinions, yet uh, there was not coming from Glacier View a, anything approaching a consensus of opinion that represented where the Adventist Church stands. And Actually, I, the interesting thing was that they did prepare a paper uh, 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 the theology people, and yet uh, that particular paper did not uh, did not uh, make it out of the out of Glacier View, and I think that's one of the most disappointing things of that particular conference. Well, that that was the earlier conference, what eleven years before, and I I could understand that if they were going to have another world conference, which brought together uh, college and university teachers and administrators from all over the world, they wanted uh, a fairly homogeneous group that would be able to reach, hopefully, some sort of consensus. That meant that there was an abundant opportunity for what you and I would call groupthink. This was no conference where it was going to be easy for anyone to speak up and say, I'm not so sure about that, you know, or I dissent. No, that was not the kind of conference it was. So uh, we shouldn't expect that kind of outcome. But there were a lot of very well-read, very well-informed and knowledgeable people there. Uh, some of them gave, many of them gave papers. Some of them did not. But uh, there was a, a final day effort to achieve a written consensus which would represent the uh, the <coughs> voted consensus of the majority of people there. I think uh, uh, the voice <coughs> the voice vote was called for, and there were lots of eyes. I think there was one no, for which uh, Ted Wilson uh, was very thankful. He said that 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 reassured him that it sounded like a real Adventist gathering. <laughs> Uh, uh, I'm going to turn that one over to Ariel yes. Roth. Well, hey, that's, those are my comments for the moment. And Dr. Roth, Dr. Roth, I must say, was, was the grand patriarch of the whole proceedings. And uh, we wished him Godspeed. <laughs> I th Have we reached the 90, the magic 90 yet, Ariel? No, three more years. Three more years? Yeah, I'm only 87. Is that all? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, 
virtually <laughs> everyone there with a speech by Jim Gibson from GRI, we all recognize that we have in our very midst a pioneer <laughs> who has stood uh, un unfailingly for defending the biblical understanding of creation and what happened. So uh, we were glad that Loma Linda was well represented. Uh, thank you for those kind words. Uh, I don't deserve them. There were many of us. Uh, I should mention especially Harold Coffin and Robert Brown. Uh, we were a rather solid core that was, I might say, uh, holding the line uh, through a tumultu tumultuous period. Uh, and uh, it's been a constant battle for some 55 years in the church. Uh, and this, this conference was different, I might state. Uh, it was so peaceful. You know, I'm used to going arguing back and forth, and you know, and your emotions go up and down. Uh, man, what a dull conference! Uh, this was, everybody was more or less agreed. There were there were very few descendants, uh, dissidents, uh, and uh, but uh, keep in mind, God is the one that leads and helps us be good. By nature, we're not that way, and I can tell you, I, I have to fight this all the time. Uh, so uh, keep, up, keep up the, uh, the fight. Uh, but um, just going on uh, Go ahead. <coughs> with, with uh, comments, Dr. yes, question. Dr. Ross, uh, were our college uh, science professors there, by and large, <coughs> Or, or were they just some? Yes, there? yes. It was a mixture. Uh, there were several division presidents. There were teachers. Uh, secondary, uh, very few secondary, mostly tertiary teachers there. Uh, there were educators uh, that. Uh, feature they were a big part of the group there per se uh, and of course uh, the, the speakers that you've heard about from Paul well just a further comment in answer to your question uh, the the visitors from all over the world were nominated by their own divisions and their own institutions so that whatever pro professors showed up at this conference they were nominated in their own field. They weren't selected, uh, generally speaking, from Silver Spring. They were representative. They were delegates in reality. But I think, I, I suspect that they were chosen because they were already were perceived as being in sympathy with a, a biblical version of, of creation. Well, uh, let me just briefly go through uh, a few pictures here again. Uh, Paul showed you, and there's going to be some duplication here, but uh, uh, I'm not going to rearrange them. Uh, in connection with uh, the conference, uh, uh, this is uh, what Joanne and, and uh, Richard Davidson. Uh, they kind of led out the whole we'll conference in terms of the later. devotionals and the, uh. the biblical view. Uh, here is uh, the keynote speaker uh, for the conference, uh, president of the general conference. And uh, I'll get to some of his statements later on in another series. But uh, he set the tone and... Uh, made some things that uh, raised a lot of questions on the internet, if you have been following it. Uh, considerable discussion on the internet about this. Uh, this is Leonard and Art uh, introducing the uh, Virgin Gorge picture. Uh, this is the uh, <coughs> center we were at in uh, St. George. Beautiful place, just the right size for us, incidentally. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, it, they took care of us. 
in a very fine way. Uh, Zion, an uh, incredible place to go on Sabbath. Spent the whole day there. Uh, some of our friends from uh, East Africa. Uh, another friend from not, not that far away. And uh, Virgin River, a beautiful place, and so on. The meeting place, uh, Paul showed you a picture of this. This is uh, where we met. And uh, uh, between sessions, a lot of talk around uh, dining. They provided vegetarian food for us. Uh, we were taken care of like you can't believe. Uh, <laughs> we're given backpacks and uh, uh, water bottles and uh, everything that, uh, let's see, uh, hats. Uh, so you can get sunburned and all this. It, it was a, a wonderful thing. And I, I really respected the, the, I presume it was Mormons. Uh, St. George is a very strong Mormon town. Uh, cooking, trying to cook vegetarian food for us and so on. Uh, they really did a good job. Uh, they, they didn't indulge in analogs uh, like we do, but uh, they really did a, it. was great, and, and I appreciated their efforts, and the food was good. Um, uh, <clears throat> Art Chadwick here uh, talking about these uh, gaps uh, between the uh, Moan Kopi and the, uh, sorry, uh, Shinarip and Moan Kopi. Uh, Tim Standish talking about original life and so on. Uh, there were some displays. Uh, Andrews University was displaying some of their books, and uh, especially Spanish ones. Uh, I put up a display about my books and uh, especially my web page, uh, so that you know all these teachers there they ought to know about it uh, if they could. And uh, my one book is in 17 languages. My second one in 10. Uh, and then the most interesting part was this uh, show of all these skulls. Uh, Lee Spencer prepared this. Unfortunately, he could not be there, but uh, uh, impressive series of, uh, I don't know, 19 or 20 skulls. Uh, uh, we probably won't have time to get to uh, his paper. It was very interesting. Created a lot of a discussion about amalgamation and so on. Uh, uh, is Neanderthal represent amalgamation, as Ellen White suggests? And the question came up, you know, did Christ die for Neanderthal? Uh, this is part, part of the, uh, part of the uh, discussion that goes on. Um, Geoscience had uh, some charts there. Uh, they prepared the posters. They prepared a beautiful series of posters. And uh, very interesting, of course, is the, the Complete set, first time I'd ever seen it, of the uh, advanced elementary school science textbooks. All ten of them, all excuse me, all eight of them were there uh, for the uh, first eighth grades of education. Uh, so that that was the uh, the general picture. Here here's the uh, uh, the Grand Canyon they went to, taken on a different day here incidentally, but. Uh, they went to this point here, uh, which is uh, Point Imperial, uh, a little bit complicated. Uh, if I can get this pointer to work, uh, the river, Colorado River, runs right here all along the, the base of that cliff there. And this is the little Colorado River coming in there. And then you've got uh, your uplift of all this region. You got the uh, Butte Fault right there, which brings up all this Precambrian material above uh, the regular layers we have here. And uh, your Tapete Sandstone right here again, uh, which is way down below over here and so on. It's a very interesting uh, uh, place. Uh, they didn't have all that much time at the, uh, it's three hours to drive from St. George to the North Rim, and three hours to get back and so on. Uh, and then they also went uh, to Bright Angel Point and there uh, saw the sequence of the Grand Canyon as it's, you know, it displayed. Uh, the outstanding point, of course, here is a tremendous, incredibly widespread nature of these layers, which you cannot place into any ordinary slow depositional pro uh, program. Uh, I'm not here to uh, 
repeat uh, myself here. Let's go on with this. And uh, very important was the uh, Grand Staircase. The Grand Canyon, folks, is just a, a minor erosional feature compared to the Great Denudation, which involves 15 to 30 times the volume of the Grand Canyon to clear off the layers that were above. Uh, they asked me to uh, coach the uh, graduate students who were leading the buses. There were nine buses, incidentally, uh, to, to the Grand Canyon and so on. So for an hour and a half, I, what, what surprised me, what those graduate students want to know, what are the arguments in favor of a short chronology? Yeah, I never had such an attendant group of uh, students in my life, I don't think, because next day they had to say something on that bus, and they, they were uh, very anxious to follow it through. But uh, this, that this is cleaned out so nicely, is evidence of a big washout, not slow, gradual erosion that leaves a lot of talus slope and so on. That's Kurt Wise here uh, talking. Um, and he, he uh, had a very, very interesting story, as uh, Paul told you. This is uh, Marcus Ross. Uh, got his degree from University of Rhode Island. Very interesting story of his troubles. Uh, these folks had serious trouble with their graduate program, like I did. Uh, and uh, they uh, did survive. And, uh, and for those of you who are interested, those are bare feet. Yes. Uh, the only person there that uh, was barefoot all the time was Marcus Ross. Uh, uh, discussion. Uh, you have... Uh, well, uh, let's see. Uh, Steve Dunbar right here. Uh, and probably this was where I think the most exciting discussion we had in the whole thing was the question of... Uh, the age of the matter of the earth. Was it before creation, was it here before creation week, or wasn't it? And so on. Uh, Paul Buchheim, uh, right here, and uh, this is uh, Kurt, Kurt, Wise. Kurt Wise, Art Chadwick, uh, John Baumgartner. Several non-Adventist leading creationists were there. And I... Uh, I suspect that uh, Dr. Brandstater had uh, something to do with that, or he doesn't realize it. And uh, it's, we've been including these folks into our conversation, and uh, they had a part here. Uh, and uh, I think uh, Dr. Brandstater kind of started that thing for us here. Uh, Ron Nalen, Ryan Nalen here, and then uh, Paul Gim. Go, just going on, uh, just a little further, we're about done here. Uh, the president of the General Conference is there. He was there for the whole time. This is very significant. Uh, he realizes very much, and uh, I'll get to his speeches in just a minute, uh, the importance of this issue to the church. Uh, he and his wife there. Uh, and then there was this uh, draft of a resolution at the end and so on, mainly addressing the issue of let's prepare materials, creation materials for our schools, uh, which I think is extremely important and, and so on. Uh, Sabbath morning report on the various schools. This was from the report from the Korea. Uh, singing. Uh, Paul had a lot to do with singing uh, and music, uh, so on. Uh, there wasn't very much music there, but they, they did manage to put a, a men's chorus together and also managed to put in a, a mixed chorus. And it was very, uh, very good. And uh, Bernard Brandstetter played the piano a lot for us. Uh, so, well, uh, you know. Can it, I just add a word about music? Uh, on the very first day, it became very obvious that no planning had been, no provision had been made for music, for singing, for worship, for gathering of any kind. 
this was just all going to be very cerebral. And um, some of us complained a bit because if you had 450 Adventists from all over the world for whom <coughs> worship isn't worship without <coughs> music and singing. Anyway, uh, we had a special gathering and uh, we persuaded them to rent a piano for the rest of the conference at St. George. And Paul went to work. <coughs> we had, amongst 450 attendees, we had one hymn book. And Paul was able to download words from the hymn book. He put them in his laptop. And through his laptop, he was able to, to project words of the hymns on the screen. And, uh, and a few other people and myself, we all pitched in and played the piano. So in fact, uh, towards the end, there was some pretty good music going on. Even a full choir that sang Sanctus on <coughs> Sabbath. And it was out of sight. So uh, uh, we rescued the music from, from nihilism <coughs> to uh, something really worshipful. Uh, I'll, I'll, <coughs> I'll say something about that. <coughs> Actually, it's not quite technically true that they had made no provision. They had a theme song. <coughs> and somebody had downloaded uh, somebody singing the theme song uh, with, with a video in the background. <coughs> and that was the extent of the preparation. And so <coughs> Arch Agret came to me the first night and said, do you know this song? Can you sing it? And no, I didn't know it, but I learned it real fast. And uh, basically, I and um, Stacy, uh, Stacy McCoy, uh, no, Hatfield, Stacy Hatfield, um, who's uh, Suzanne Phillips' sister, who's the new um, chair of the, uh, 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 the Earth and Biological Sciences here at Loma Linda. Uh, uh, she and I led the music the first night, and then as we were able to, we got off of the video because the video was kind of irritating. It kept giving you the words after they were singing. Which, <laughs> uh, and uh, 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 what's his name? Um, Monty Fleming, who happens to be a classical guitarist, played uh, the music, uh, uh, played the guitar accompaniment for it. And then once the piano came in and we had more of the piano than we did that too. Um, for one, I think one session, I actually filled in on the accordion while we were playing uh, before the piano was ready to be done. So it was kind of, we patched it together as best we could. It came out okay, I guess. Um, Your bass voice helped, Paul. Oh, well, yeah. You passed it on to me. I thought <laughs> I had a contract with West African Ebola. <laughs> Uh, let me uh, give uh, one other person who was there a chance to comment, and then we'll throw the uh, we'll throw it open for questions and comments. Um, <coughs> Danila Boscovich was uh, there oh, as well. Um, I, the one thing that really warmed the cockles of my heart uh, was that um, uh, there was a significant recognition of the value of basic research. Um, and this is something that among our Adventists uh, has generally been part of a blind spot. Uh, we, we are preparing for the soon coming of Christ, and so we're pe preparing people for service uh, and healing and teaching and serving ministries. <coughs> but uh, nobody ever thought, I mean, the, the very idea that some research needed to be done so we would have something to teach uh, was somehow overlooked. Uh, this wasn't done deliberately. It was something that was just part of a blind spot that hadn't occurred to us. And perhaps many Adventists have thought of research just about as exciting as watching grass grow. But, um, you and know... it can be. Uh, it can be. It can be very tedious, but it requires patience, endurance, <laughs> Uh, you know, blood, sweat, and tears sometimes to to get to an understanding of what what is uh, the nature of the problem that's being dealt with. 
but that's the nature of doing research and somebody has to do it otherwise we have nothing new to teach and and I'm so delighted to see that one of the points of resolution in fact is uh, the need for research and to encourage more of our faculty in all our various institutions to uh, think in those terms. Um, at this point, I'm going to give the floor back to Dr. Roth, yeah, and then after that, we'll, uh, we'll just thought you might uh, be interested in some of the things that uh, Elder Wilson um, said. Uh, let me just put this brief historical perspective on this. We have been discussing this issue in this church for 55 years. Uh, was this a change? I can't tell you because I can't predict the future. I can tell you that uh, this was definitely the strongest and firmest statement I have ever heard from church leadership about this issue. And there was no question about where the church stands. There's no question that uh, church is not especially interested in arguing this further and further. And, uh, the church should not change into a semi-vegetarian discussion or, I might say, debate society. The church has a mission to save souls, to help God save souls, and uh, that was very much brought into focus here. Uh, here are a few, just a few of the comments that Elder Wilson made. That as teachers on the campus of Seventh-day Adventist academies, colleges, and universities, and leaders in God's church, hold firmly to a literal recent creation and absolutely reject theistic and general evolutionary theory. 30 years ago, 40 years ago, uh, this was not much of an issue in the church. It has crept in to an extent that uh, something needed to be said. If one does not accept a recent six-day creation understanding, then that person is actually not a seven-day Adventist since the seven-day Sabbath would become absolutely meaningless historically and theologically, and most of our biblically-based doctrines centered in Christ and his authoritative voice would become meaningless as well. And it's not just Christ, of course, Peter talked about it, God talks about six days and so on. The whole Bible falls apart on that issue. Uh, going on here, uh, and here's probably the most significant, or at least the most reactive statement there was. He cautiously, and he, he was cautious about this, he said, and he, educators should support creationism from the heart or to do the honorable thing and resign. Uh, in our schools, par Adventist parents send their children to Adventist schools and faith in the Bible is destroyed by some of the teachers. This is what he's speaking against here. <laughs> According to the Adventist Review Online, there was a, uh, an interview that uh, I was not part of and so on. It is, a, it is vital that every employee, whether an administrator, pastor, teacher, or whoever, should strongly believe in the fundamental understanding of creation as the Seventh-day uh, enunciates it to continue to be employed and hold a view other than that would not be compatible with the very reason for the existence of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Well, you can see why these things generate a lot of discussion on the internet. Uh, uh, this is uh, his closing address on um, Sunday afternoon. Please do not in any way be reluctant to stand for biblical truth. Be open, be careful but be bold. So on. Now let me just say a little word of caution here. We do not necessarily need to point out everybody's sins and act holier than other people, but God uses people to bring about clarity and an understanding of what is not being followed according to his word, and he will use you and may others and many others to do that. Uh, let's see. I think 
to bring up <coughs> clarity and uh, what is not being followed. Yeah, okay. Uh, and then uh, lastly, he referred to Joshua, and you know that. Sorry. It's for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then he finishes here, your, your public biblical witness is greatly needed in every area of education and church life, as we all participate in the mission of the church to proclaim Christ, his righteousness, his censorship, a creatorship, his sanctuary service, his Sabbath, his three angels message, and his soon return. So it, uh, this is a, a very clear statement of the issue and what is involved and a very clear statement of what they expect of Seventh-day Adventist teachers uh, in our educational institutions are uh, very much needed uh, uh, statement I think in, in my opinion and so much so that, that's that that you know set the tone for the whole thing there per se and uh, all kinds of interesting discussion went on in between these two speeches. Any comments, questions? You have the privilege of being in one of the richest geological sites on planet Earth. I imagine <laughs> that in itself was thrilling and inspiring and seeing the Creator's hand, handiwork. What, what is the thinking now on flood geology? I, some of the reports I read on the internet said we're shifting slightly. We used to put most of this in the flood. Now we're allowing for some activity outside the flood. Is, is that uh, in flux or is the main focus just on flood and fossils? Um, there have been in the past, and so uh, you, you need to keep in mind, IDs change and are uh, revised and people change their minds and so on. Uh, there was a tendency, uh, I think, especially in about the uh, 60s and 70s to try and squeeze the flood down to just a very small part of maybe <laughs> Uh, the uh, Mesozoic, because, uh, uh, you know, the problems were brought from the top, from the bottom up, and from the top down, so on and so forth. Uh, the definition of how much of the column you're going to put in was not discussed, as I recall, in this conference per se. But in general, from the comments, you could tell that uh, uh, Paleozoic, most of the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic was being put into it. Uh, some suggested maybe the Cenozoic was not. I uh, tend to resist that because so many of your mammals are in the Cenozoic. I can't f put the story of, you know, uh, uh, weren't any mammals destroyed during the flood? Uh, so I. Uh, I tend to go up a little higher. Uh, Baumgartner tends to go up a little higher, but the, some of the others that were there, and the, you know, there were four non-Adventists. Uh, there, uh, some of them uh, definitely uh, stop at the top of the Cenozoic. Uh, so it, that's that's where it is right now. Thank you. Yeah. I, I would say there's a couple of other things too, and that is that. Um, <clears throat> This is actually an area of active research. <clears throat> uh, one of the things you can expect is that after the flood, carbon-14 started uh, rapidly going up. <clears throat> um, it turns out that it, that's not as easy a project to do as you might think. Um, I have tried to get the University of California at Riverside to just do uh, um, general carbon contents of uh, a couple of fossils. And uh, they sound enthusiastic and then they don't follow through. And I, I don't know whether they're just busy or whether they're worried about um, uh, creationist associations. That there, there is a laboratory that cooperated with creationists and then for some reason lost it. 
it's grant money, so <clears throat> I can understand people being a little apprehensive about that. Um, and uh, yes, I, I wonder if you could share with us what kind of response there has been from people who within the church who are not necessarily sympathetic to creation and who may be teaching at our institutions and who were not invited and what their response was to the conference in general and to what has come out as what happened at the conference. I, I can only go by uh, some things on the internet or per se and so on, what the response is. Uh, many of these, and uh, I think there's a fairly strong negative reaction from Europe, and a whole bunch of German there, which I did not take time to read. Uh, it takes me about a half hour to read one page in German. Uh, but anyway, uh, the, uh, uh, many of these have been hoping that the church would broaden out its spectrum and include all kinds of things, well, uh, so that, uh, you know, uh, more or less any idea would go in the Adventist church, which is uh, an effective way of destroying a church. If a church has no beliefs, there's no point in having it. A church is entitled to loyalty, uh, and it's entitled to an identity. Uh, you destroy the identity of a church, uh, why have it? Uh, the uh, the readings on uh, some of the bl uh, blogs uh, uh, are mixed. Uh, some you know very much in favor of it. Some very much against it. How could how could the church be so stupid? Uh, you know, after all, half a million scientists disagree with this. Can they be all wrong? Uh, which is one of the questions I raised in a comment I made. Uh, when I was talking to the group, uh, it, it does happen, you know. Paradigms dominate, and you know, we, we go into witch hunting, and the whole population goes into witch hunting. We all go into alchemy for a while, and, and the whole population goes there. So this is the way. I don't expect this to hold up. I say this not because of the uh, stand of the Adventist Church, but because of this very scientific data that Paul and I talk about here at times. You know. The thing is not holding up, folks. It's, I make that statement from that perspective. The general tenor of the uh, conference was, no, we, we, we're people of the book, we believe the Bible, and uh, uh, that's, that's where we stand. Fine, I'm glad. Most people come to Adventism, I think, by that route. But there are some that need the scientific data and I can tell you the scientific data uh, so much more in favor of creation now than it was 20, 30 years ago because of <laughs> the advances in molecular biology. Uh, we didn't know about erosion rates then. We didn't know about uh, these tremendously widespread layers that fit the flood, you know, and so on. It's, uh, the stuff is there. One has a choice. No question about it. Uh, you don't have to give up your scientific integrity to believe the Bible. You have a choice. Just go out there and look at the stuff. Uh, there, you cannot explain it on the basis of slow changes over millions of years type of thing, uh, paraconformities and so on. Uh, there's sufficient data there for you to, to say, no, uh, I can believe the Bible. The other thing that's happened in the last uh, 15 years is uh, radiocarbon. Radiocarbon dating, yes, residual uh, carbon dating. Uh, you know, uh, Paul uh, <laughs> gave a very good talk about you know this suppression of that data. Uh, people don't, you know, the, the long ages paradigm is so strong, and I understand these folks. Because you go out there now, you know, uh, nothing happens. Uh, you go to the San Bernardino Mountains and you go there and you go there a year later and the same rocks are in the same place and nothing happens. Unless you're <laughs> willing to take into 
PID that, hey, there's been a major catastrophe here. Uh, you're allowed to get stuck on, hey, hey, things change very slowly. But then you get out there and you look at certain things and uh, take something like the Shinar conglomerate spread over 100,000 square miles and it's only about 100 feet thick. I mean, this is something you cannot relate to anything that's going on on the surface of the present year at present. Furthermore, to have all those flat layers out there, you gotta have a very flat surface on which to lay them. And then they have gaps between those layers and there virtually no erosion, so. Uh, the scientific data kind of compels you at times to, to uh, uh, believe in favor of the, the biblical uh, model, yes. Some of it doesn't. Uh, and just a minute, Some Charles, doesn't. and then oh. him, and then uh, I'll just, get a, just a couple of things I wanted to point out. Number one, um, the geology column, the perfect one is found only in the textbook. True. It's mighty important to remember. I agree to a certain extent, but you cannot reject the geodic column as some creations do. No, not rejecting. Uh, and as Adventists used to do. Uh, because, uh, you know, it's there and it's in order. And uh, there is, you know, no one has found a mammal in the Grand Canyon yet. Well, you know, th th this, this is an issue, and to, to me, that and radio measure you know, are two main issues we have to contend with. But there's enough of the other data out there that tells you you have a scientific choice here. Right. Yes. Okay. Uh, the next point is uh, in the 70s, a gentleman from Australia, uh, Jeffrey Paxton, wrote a, wrote a book called Shaking of Adventism. Many of us might have read that book. Um, we Adventists are known for meetings and for conferences, you know, um, and that's what he criticized of us, us also on this. On this one, I think would have been nice if they opened it to the public, um, and I hope in the future they do it. Uh, I got some friends who are big bosses of church all over the world, mm -hmm. and I teased them. I said, you guys are always in the plane. You're flying here, flying there, go conference here, go to conference there. And, um, <coughs> What is the effect of this to the lowly church somewhere in the boondocks, you know, uh, on the, of these conferences? So, uh, quench not, I want to shift a little bit. Uh, our young people, we are losing our young people by the thousands because, well, God said it and I believe it. Uh, that does not do it. And one of the points was made earlier, well, the Bible says so and we're going to stay this way. No, there's mm -hmm. more than enough evidence to trust in this book. You see, and we should not say, well, this is the way, I, I, of course, I like what Ted Wilson says, this is great. Yes, uh, this is, we believe in this, and if you don't, don't come and teach here, go teach somewhere else. However, we just kind of tell our young people, well, this is how it is, and it should not the, be done. There was a little too much of that yes. very point yes. that you mentioned at this conference. Yes. I, I feel very uncomfortable with that. Truth ought to make more sense than error. I want to use my reasoning in deciding what is true. I want to know why do I pick the Bible as God's word instead of the Book of Mormon. I, to blind, blindly just say, well, no, we start with the Bible. I'm more comfortable if you go a little deeper behind that question. I was wondering if there was any discussion on the pre-existence matter of the earth when God began creation. Yeah, they, they, mm -hmm. there was a fairly strong discussion. I mean, that, I think that was the hottest discussion in the whole thing. Uh, and the Adventists took a very collegial attitude, uh, especially our non-Adventists were of the opinion that uh, the matter of the earth uh, was not here before creation week. Uh, and uh, we took a, uh, yeah, it's not that important an issue type of thing. I, uh, uh, so 
everything was okay, but uh, you could tell the Adventists uh, were a little bit shocked at that issue because uh, so many of our Adventist scientists do feel that the matter of the earth was here before. Uh, it went off very nicely uh, without any resolution. It's interesting that uh, several geologists who studied the aftermath of St. Helens and especially the uh, mud uh, <coughs> flow there that uh, then had the uh, sudden uh, breakthrough and it has this 30 foot uh, wall and you, they look at this 30 foot wall and here is a whole series of layers that are mimicking the layers of the Grand Canyon in this wall and they know exactly the time that it took for that uh, wall to be formed about uh, 12, 14 hours period of time. Yeah. Uh, you can lay down layers very fast. Uh, the, the thing that really shocks me, I'm still not sure that, uh, McKee and Guchek uh, have written the classic monograph on the Red Wall in the Grand Canyon. And in that monograph, they make the statement that the four different divisions of the Grand Canyon, one of the Red Wall, one on top of the other, are, conti are contiguous throughout the Grand Canyon. Now, the, the Red Wall is only, you know, about four or 500 feet high. How do you lay down over 15,000 square miles? And of course, the Red Wall goes, uh, you know, um, more like 50,000 square miles beyond the Grand Canyon. But uh, sticking to their comment in the Grand Canyon, how do you have such a flat topography, uh, not more of a variation than 100 feet, over 15,000 square miles, so you can lay the next one on top so it can be continuous? So you can, like the next one on top, so it can be continuous, and next one on top. Uh, this is almost hard to believe, even under a catastrophic model. It's certainly much easier to consider under a catastrophic model, but under a long ages type of deposition type <coughs> of model. Uh, this challenges everything that we see, all local rivers putting little deposits here and there and so on. Uh, uh, it just doesn't fit that at all. I'm wondering what you think the future holds. Is this another one of this too shall pass uh, conferences, or I, are we going to have I a witch hunt could, now and mm -hmm. search out these people that are less than we are and uh, expel them? Uh, I wish I could tell you for sure. I can say this is the strongest affirming statement I've ever seen from church leadership on this issue. Uh, over the uh, 55 years and so on of uh, geoscience and so on, uh, there have been, you know, uh, uh, well, uh, you're doing a great job uh, type of thing. Uh, no, I think this, this is a, uh, and the fact that they had, you know, so many division presidents there, so many uh, educational directors there and so on. Uh, this may have an impact. Furthermore, the resolution at the end that uh, they want to get educational materials out ready very quickly for our schools. Uh, this is unprecedented. I can't predict the future. I don't know. Uh, I, but it, it is, let's face it, it is difficult to ask the Adventist church to, to change its belief in the Sabbath. You know, we're Seventh-day Adventist, first part of our name. Hey, how are you going to change that? Uh, it's like asking the Catholic Church to give up their pope. Uh, it's not going to work, I don't think, at least so far. Uh, you know, there have been significant intellectual inroads into this issue in the Adventist Church. Uh, but uh, when it comes to people who aren't involved in that, but who usually run the, I mean, speaking of the church leaders around the world, uh, they, they're not buying it. They're not buying it. Uh, so uh, will this stop the debate? No, of course not. 
uh, science goes on and so on. Uh, but I think this will probably significantly uh, emphasize what Adventism means, what it stands for, and uh, uh, what you can what you can expect. Uh, I hope so. Anyway, did because a church a church without identity is not a church. Did Lisa Beardsley? Because that's the one lecture I did not get to hear any of. Uh, did she speak no, she, to she, that she, at all? she talked in gen just general terms of academic freedom, and uh, especially she spoke about uh, how teachers are responsible to the community they serve, uh, and she quoted the uh, uh, university uh, AUP, American Association of University Professors, their document states that very well, and so on, so that, uh, that was her approach to it, uh, per se, in terms of academic freedom. Uh, we must have academic freedom. We must always inspect when new data comes in. But the primary purpose of the Advent Church is not to just debate these issues. The primary purpose of the Advent Church is to help God save as many people as possible. And we must keep that in mind. Check it all the time. Uh, I mean, check the new data all the time and so on. But don't make that your prime uh, life uh, career. I, I think it's important after watching many things come and go as being somehow important for our salvation from my hair length to my musical taste to everything else that we not confuse those type of items that is the speck in my eye and the, or the, somebody else's eye that people go after to be holier than thou and the fundamental fact that you cannot have Christology and have death and dying before the fall. And you cannot do evolution and still maintain a Christianity. It doesn't matter, mm -hmm. as one professor said here, that many Christians across, the majority of Christians across the world believe in theistic evolution or whatever. It doesn't matter. Fundamentally, you cannot have a redeemer unless you have a fall. And you cannot have a fall without a perfect world beforehand and a creation. <laughs> so. That's a whole lot different issue than arguing over my salvation is related to my musical taste or whatever other small item you want to. So it is, I think, very encouraging that while difficult for some people to handle this, we are taking a stand because, as you say, we do not have a Sabbath. We do not have a seventh day. We do not have Christology without this stand. And if that's the case, why am I sending my kids to our school? Why am I supporting our educational system? So I think it is a very fundamental issue that we, we need to not allow people to sidetrack as if it's another one of these fads that comes and goes or it's another one of these things that are personal preference. I don't think we have that option with this issue. No, I, yeah, I, I don't think it, it's hard. It's going to be hard to change the Adventist Church on this issue uh, when, it get, when it gets to the uh, annual council, uh, that level of... Uh, uh, in our in our uh, academic institutions, yes, there are inroads, definite inroads, uh, and so on. And I would add, uh, it is difficult to uh, keep the authentic integrity of the Bible if you give up on creation, because it's it's not just the first eleven chapters of Genesis that are traditionally excluded from. Uh, reality in uh, many uh, Christian churches. It's the fact that, you know, God said he did it. Uh, God talks about the flood in Psalms. God, uh, uh, Peter talks about the flood and creation. Uh, is Peter deceiving us? Christ talks about the flood and creation. Uh, are these folks all fooling us? If, if they don't count, I mean, what's the whole thing about? You, you tend to lose the whole game here because the Bible is sufficiently integrated on this issue. This will be part two of my little uh, questioning period. I noticed that uh, <clears throat> in most conferences, there's very little said about 
paleobotany. But this time, there was a report I see on the screen, Paul, of the agenda report on the Yellowstone Fossil Forest. That's not a dead issue. That's not passe. That's, that's current. That's live. It's, there's some good data coming out of that. And Adventist uh, paleobotany really made its mark, not only within the church, but outside the church. Uh, papers were done that were published or presented at conferences and so on. Now, what uh, I'm concerned about is the use of the term evolution. <laughs> Because when we say it's creation or evolution, and we reject evolution, uh, we have a problem with paleobotany. For example, if we end the flood, and this is related to part one of my questioning, if we end the flood, let's say, at the end of the Mesozoic or very early in, in the Cenozoic, you have almost no flowering plants. You know, you probably could count maybe a hundred varieties or so. <laughs> I have a book on fossil plants that just came out. Right now, the, the count on fossil plants in terms of species and living plants, mm -hmm. flowering plants, 400,000, and it keeps going up by the year. There are 250,000 species alone of flowering plants. Yet, most of the Paleozoic, all of the Paleozoic has very little evidence. There might be a little bit. Certainly all the Mesozoic, except for Cretaceous, has no evidence of flowering plant leaves. Then all of a sudden you end the flood, and all these varieties develop in the last maybe 10,000 years. That's about as far as we want to stretch it. I know Randy Yonker is willing to go to 10,000 years. Mm -hmm. He even iterated that at the conference, I understand. But uh, to put the evolution of 400,000 species after the flood, because there's almost nothing before the flood, mm -hmm. to me that's mega evolution on a grand scale. But I would like mm -hmm. to see a conference where we discuss some of these bigger, hotter issues. So that's would I. my little plea. So would I. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> There's probably but, some answers, but... But, uh, well, uh, let me uh, just throw this out. Uh, this is my private uh, view. Okay. Uh, certain not what was discussed at the conference. Okay. Uh, I'm uncomfortable with uh, flood ending that low. Uh, I think some people go clear up into the Pleistocene. Uh, I, I want at least the Miocene included. Uh, and furthermore, I want those plants, I'm coming to ecological zonation, those plants were kept up in the higher levels because of other plants like Calamites, Lepidodendron, you, you, all these coal things. Uh, They're all extinct, all the All extinct ones. now. We don't know how competitive these were with these others, and if they excluded these others, and if there was a temperature gradient, as some data suggests, uh, flowering plants stayed up higher. Uh, that's just my suggestion on it. Thank you. I, I'm going to make a couple of suggestions on that. Um, <clears throat> the first one came from Kurt Wise, who uh, uh, actually, during, this was, I think, during the comments, suggested that uh, maybe one of the reasons we don't find humans is because the particular part of the Earth where they were most populous actually wound up getting subducted. Um, getting subducted. That it was a... <clears throat> It was kind of Atlantis that just dove not just below the waters, but all the way into the center of the earth, uh, or at least the, the, the low mantle. And uh, uh, it's very interesting because his idea is not that much different from Ellen White, who talks about um, the places where people were got buried the deepest. And maybe 
the deepest was deeper than anybody had any idea. Uh, that's one possibility. I, I will also point out something that, that may not be as obvious now. Many of the angiosperms now do wind pollination, although not as many as we would expect. Um, but if you have an environment where the wind is very light, uh, that it's gentle breezes and that's about it, then wind is not a very good way of pollinating. And if that's the case, one might expect to see even more in the pre-flood world than it is now um, animal-assisted pollination. Bees, wasps, flies, various other kinds of uh, creatures that now do it, but to a much less extent. And what we may actually be looking at is there wasn't as much pollen spread around simply because <clears throat> it was not being, um, uh, you know, what little pollen there was was being uh, spread more efficiently. That's the kind of discussion we need. Um, it's not just wind that carries pollen, it's water. My uh, major professor at Michigan State, when I studied fossil pollen, was A.T. Cross. He just died, by the way, at age 98 this summer. Um, he had several Adventist students, too, and including Lanny Fisk is a name that mm -hmm. some of you might know. Um, he studied the Gulf of California sediments, and he was finding both fossil and recent pollen. The fossil mm -hmm. pollen was from the Mesozoic, upper Mesozoic of Colorado was the nearest source. It was clear out in the Gulf of California, and this is when the Colorado River was much stronger and carried <laughs> sediments way out. So you probably have to have a way of keeping pollen from getting into water to keep it up in the highlands. Otherwise, the water is going to take it down, at least to the deltas in the lowlands. But anyway, there's, we need to look at these various angles. I appreciate your suggestion. Wind could have been different. And the other thing is water apparently was different, too. That could no have been, rain. Too. Maybe uh, it went uphill. <laughs> uh, no, uh, but, uh, but what I'm saying is if, you, if most of what you uh, get is, is modification. The rising waters of the flood. Huh? Uh, <laughs> I've never heard that one before. <laughs> that, uh, that I think that, uh, you know, the only time you really have rain that you're going to be worried about is, is at the flood itself. So, uh, I mean, I used to worry about this, like, uh, for carbon-14 dating, how come you have so many different, uh, <clears throat> apparently, backgrounds? And I, I've come to the conclusion that uh, carbon-14 simply was not spread in the free flood world the way it is now, and it collected much like chlorine-36 does in the about 45 degrees latitude and, and not much further, uh, magnetic latitude and not much further south. Uh, and what's happening today, of course, is that you get it produced there, but it gets mixed all in with everything else, and so you get a relatively uniform uh, biosphere, whereas before the flood, the biosphere was not as uniform. Um, some, some have suggested, uh, somebody Warren, had a hand over there. that uh, you probably uh, <coughs> much more in authority on this than, than I am, uh, that uh, when a... Uh, Palynologist runs into a uh, flowering plant pollen down in the Mesozoic, he, he tends to consider its contamination because contamination is such a problem. Uh, that needs to be evaluated. I don't know. Uh, I can see where the, I would do it myself uh, because uh, it's not supposed to be there uh, type of thing. but. The, uh, we do have to consider in this whole issue that you're raising that implicit in the model of the flood is the fact that a whole series of different kinds of plants and animals lived in the Mesozoic, Upper Paleozoic, Mesozoic, uh, that we're totally unfamiliar with now. 
and that we don't know what ecological requirements they had, per se. Uh, and uh, until you take that into account in your model, don't try and use present ecology to evaluate it. You've got to take it into account. It's implicit. Um, there is a lot of work now being done on um, basically uh, working through the genomic analysis of various plants and other organisms in the biosphere. And as that information becomes more complete, the relative relatedness or similarity between different uh, organisms will be clearer. Um, it is also possible that many of the apparently very different organisms may be very closely related, uh, but happen to, um, how should I say, um, come in different apparent forms depending on circumstances and environmental conditions. Um, I remember once taking a course in fungi uh, and discovering that there are certain species of fungi that can quite literally exist as four morphologically very distinct organisms that don't appear to have anything in common with one another. Uh, that are yet genetically absolutely identical and um, except for uh, a, a gender issue. Uh, they may have male and female and plus and minus for either of the male and female, uh, thus having four different possible genders, uh, each of which has four different, I mean, individual forms. Uh, such things are going to be clear only after thorough genomic analysis for all the various organisms. Until then, we will have a lot of arguments as to uh, morphological similarities and such, which, which may or may not be useful. I'd like to finish up answering one question that has been raised. Um, are, are the results of this coming out? Some of the results will not come out because they are intended, they were reports that were intended to eventually be published. And until they're either published or rejected, uh, the people who made those reports do not want them to be uh, published on the internet for the simple reason that uh, uh, once they're published on the internet, they're not publishable in the standard scientific literature. Uh, the people who run their journals think that, well, it's already published and, you know, we don't have to publish it here. Um, <clears throat> some of it, uh, my talk included, are available uh, to be downloaded whenever. Uh, although if you look at it, you'll recognize that my talk has been given before, so uh, it's not that much different. I mean, there's a, a little different twist to it. I've simplified some parts of it a little bit and uh, brought out the implications a little more. So it's not exactly the same talk, but it's, it's pretty close. And where do we find it? What's your internet address? Um, I'll have to find out exactly where they're where they're going to be publishing it, um, and I'll be I can put it in the the general email when as soon as I do. But it's my understanding that people who are willing to have theirs uh, published uh, will be able to do so. Um, it would be better if we started out, I think, with a uh, with an understanding that everything should be published, and I think that's one of the lessons of this, of this conference, is that I think that eventually we're going to want to have at the end of the uh, conference something that everybody can sink their teeth into. Because I do think that otherwise what we're doing is sort of talking quietly among the leaders and not really 
uh, spreading it to the general Adventist populace, or for that matter, in my opinion, the general populace period, because I, I think that these things could be uh, evangelistic in nature in, in one sense, in that when you see what the scientific evidence is on some particular subject, or for that matter, you see a good study in the biblical evidence that um, people anywhere can read it and understand it, and if it appeals to evidence that they agree with, and if it uh, uh, follows logical conclusions that they agree with, then it invites them to, to join, at least in that particular area, the person who is making uh, the uh, presentation. And so I, I think that that's one of the things that we should probably do is next time, if you have a sensitive paper that, you know, don't present it this time. Present it another time when you've either published it or you found out you can't publish it anywhere else. And I think that Origins would probably be willing to uh, republish papers. I, I can't speak for the current uh, editorship, but I think that if you had something that was worthwhile, but that it was only out there as an internet paper, that they'd be willing to publish, to say, a more scholarly version of it. Uh, so I think eventually you could get published. You wouldn't be able to do it in the standard scientific literature, and I think that that's a, that's a problem we just have to work around. Um, but I'd like to see that happen. I've been to many scientific conferences, and I intend to continue going there. And it is generally a rule. This is a rule. A you cannot go to one of those conferences if you intend to broadcast what you've seen or, or, or done. That cannot be done. The reason is very simple. There are specific rules for that. If you want to have free exchange of ideas, for things that are currently being worked on, you have to be able to freely discuss them before they're ready to pub be published. If you're going to only talk about things that have already been published, well, that's a different sort of venue. So and if, that's we're what having, I'm if we're having a <clears throat> conference which is more like akin to an evangelistic series, where everybody's going to bring data that's already been published and already in scientific literature, fine, that is wonderful. But if we have a conference that is meant to bring us together in order to discuss what is currently being worked on and what people are really looking for seminal input from one another, we need to understand this as well. This is not something uh, an attempt to be secretive or keeping people in the dark. It is simply an attempt to, hey, we need to work on this. We need to understand what we're talking about before we actually publicly say it. This and is, this my, is just my point, common sense. My point is this. That I think there's room for both kinds of conferences. But when they start out, we need to understand which kind they are. And if they're the one where we're exploring stuff and we don't want to publish because it may wind up getting published later, then that should be upfront, uh, and then basically, uh, and, and vice versa, it should be upfront, so that people don't come to the one conference presenting papers that they expect something else to have happen to, um, and that so that people understand that the closed conference is being closed not because, uh, not because we're trying to be quiet about our beliefs, but rather because we're exploring stuff that is in certain cases, at least time sensitive. Uh, and I'd like to see both kinds of conferences going on, maybe one one year, maybe one another year, to where we, we do explore stuff, but we also uh, present things that can be presented to everybody. <coughs> but that's my opinion. You folks have a good Sabbath. <laughs>